Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today entitled Menachem Begin, Revolutionary Peacemaker. My name is Naomi Reinhartz. I'm the Chief Development Officer of the America-Israel Friendship League. I'm based in New York, and I'm delighted to be welcoming not only our panelists, but all of our viewers from Israel and the United States and around the world. Um, as always, please say in the chat and on Facebook Live where you're calling in from. I already see people um, posting from both the U.S. and from Israel in different communities. So thank you for joining us today. We also have gotten many wonderful comments and questions already before this presentation about people's views of Menachem Begin. Was he a peacemaker? Was he a war maker? Um, talking about his personal life, his professional life. Um, he certainly is someone that people have a lot of opinions about, and we will delve into those a little bit more today. Um, we will be showing um, a few clips from the Menachem Begin Heritage Center, and we will have time for questions and answers. So please um, feel free for the next hour to put your questions into the chat, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. So um, I would first like to introduce our um, two speakers for today. We have Herzl Makov calling in from Israel. He has been the CEO of the Menachem Begin Heritage Center for the last 21 years. And under his leadership, the center has grown. It's now one of the leaders in Zionist and democratic education, um, which is led by the values of Menachem Begin. They serve thousands of young people and soldiers um, who participate in its many programs every single year. And we also have Paul Gross, um, who is a senior fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. Um, he has a responsibility for developing the educational programming and the public events. Um, he lectures quite widely to groups on Israeli history and politics, and he writes on a number of topics, um, including Israeli and Middle East affairs um, and others. So um, we look forward to getting into the content of the program um, in a few minutes. Um, Herzl, why don't you start um, with your opening remarks for our audience, and then we'll turn it over to Paul. Great. Thank you, Naomi. Shalom to everybody from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, I really was confused how to open. Should I say good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening? But uh, since uh, we are spread all over, I realized that shalom would be the appropriate, appropriate uh, uh, word uh, to open uh, this um, <clears throat> webinar. Uh, whenever we have in Israel a survey about uh, past prime ministers, uh, you know, uh, sometimes in, uh, towards the holidays uh, in the newspaper, they ask uh, uh, who was the most important prime minister, who was uh, the most influential, the most beloved prime minister, who would you uh, like to come back? Although I don't know about technology yet to do that, uh, but still, always two are coming first. And those are uh, David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, and Menachem Begin, the sixth Prime Minister of Israel. And the rest are uh, significantly uh, down below uh, those two. Um, and when you compare to other uh, uh, countries, Always everybody knows who was the first prime minister or the first uh, uh, president, right? Go uh, in the States and ask about the first president. Most of the people would know about George Washington. But go to uh, and ask uh, who was the sixth uh, president. I think that you will hardly find uh, those who will knew about uh, John Quincy Adams. Uh, I didn't know, by the way, until I looked up uh, in order to be prepared for this uh, conversation. Um, so how come Menachem Begin um, is so known and so uh, popular in Israel as a prime minister? And why are they comparing and putting the same place as Ben-Gurion as the two fourth fathers of, uh, of the state? I believe that if we will compare it to the states, <coughs> Begin place in history is like uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln place in the history of, uh, the, uh, of the United States. Uh, they both changed the society, the nation. Thank God Menachem Begin without civil war, 
But Israel after Menachem Begin is a different Israel. Uh, some would say for the better, some would say for the worse. But uh, from 48 until Menachem Begin came to power, we were, we were under the influence, under the inspiration of uh, David Ben-Gurion uh, leadership, which based on the collective socialist uh, stream. And Menachem Begin uh, are coming from the liberal uh, stream, as he called it, the national liberal. Um, and he m- puts the focus of the society, of the state, of the freedom of the, uh, of the individual. And uh, that element, and the fact that he has a very intensive uh, term as prime minister, uh, and his personality and the way uh, he perceived as a leader uh, promised his uh, position in the history of the state of Israel. And that's why I uh, want to thank and appreciate the America-Israel uh, Friendship League for deciding to uh, give us the opportunity uh, to speak a little bit about Menachem Begin and to see some uh, videos about Menachem Begin. Uh, and to you uh, people to ask a question and to learn a little bit uh, also about uh, Menachem Begin. So I uh, hope that we will, uh, enj- that you will all uh, uh, enjoy this uh, webinar and it's going to be a fruitful and uh, educated, uh, educating uh, event for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And let's turn it over to Paul to speak a little bit about his work at the center and what the center's um, work is all about and tell us what we'll be viewing together today. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you uh, everyone who's uh, watching and the America's or Friendship League. Um, so uh, as was mentioned in the uh, uh, generous introduction, uh, I have responsibility here at the Center for um, most, of the, uh, most of the educational programming and public events and seminars that we do here in English. Um, naturally, because of the uh, w- global situation, we've, we've had some less of those uh, here at the Center than, than we would normally have. Um, but we've been doing a lot of uh, events on Zoom. Uh, I've been hosting a weekly Zoom uh, event uh, where I uh, introduce or bring a, a guest speaker looking at a different issue of uh, Israeli uh, politics or security issues or the Middle East or uh, Jewish issues. Um, and that's something that that's that's one of the ways in which the center has been um, contributing to the wider conversation about Israel and Zionism and uh, democracy, um, uh, inspired by by the legacy and, and values of, of Menachem Begin. Um, and, um, and I'm happy to say that we've been doing we've been able to do that also in English, uh, as well as obviously the, in Hebrew, which is obviously the, the majority of the, of the center's work. Um, What we're going to do over the next uh, hour is watch together um, three three segments from the uh, virtual tour of the of the museum here at the center, um, each looking at a a chapter in the life of Menachem Begin. Uh, And in between watching each segment, um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have to expand on on what you've seen. Uh, So we're going to start with uh, a short segment looking at Begin's early life. Uh, his rise to be the commander of the Edsel uh, underground military movements, also known as the Irgun, uh, which was fighting for uh, for Jewish independence uh, and sovereignty in the land of Israel, and specifically liberation from the from the rule of the of the British mandate. So we're going to start with that. We are on the Mount of Olives, the ancient cemetery of Jerusalem, at the grave plot of Aliza and Menachem Begin, the sixth prime minister of the state of Israel. Unlike other prime ministers who are buried on Mount Herzl or on a private estate, Menachem Begin requested to be buried as an ordinary citizen. Furthermore, he requested to be buried in this exact spot, alongside the famous fighters in the pre-state underground, Meir Feinstein and Moshe Barazani. But why alongside these fighters? Follow me. (laughs) 
On the 2nd of ER, 5707, April 21st, 1947, late at night, a fierce explosion shakes the prison cell of the two death row inmates, Meir Feinstein, an Irgun fighter, and Moshe Barazani, a Lehi fighter. The two fighters, sentenced to death by the mandatory authorities, have decided to take their own lives rather than let the British lead them to the gallows. They embrace, placing between their hearts a hand grenade smuggled into their cell disguised as an orange and detonated upon. But every ending has a beginning, and our story begins elsewhere. Welcome to the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. Here you can hear everything about Menachem Begin, from his birth to his death. This is where it all began, the city of Brisk in Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. In the city of Brisk, where Begin grew up, there was a large Jewish community, until the outbreak of World War I. Brisk, the city of my birth, sits on the banks of the Bug River, along the Polish border with Russia. In my parents' house, the conversation always centered on the fate of the Jewish people and on the land of Israel. And then a life-changing event occurs. The first time I saw Jabotinsky was when he spoke at a conference in Brisk. I was 16 years old. My life had changed. You sit and listen to a man and feel with all your being how he raises you higher and higher. Were you captivated? No, he was sanctified. I joined Betar, fully realizing that this was the movement through which I wanted to serve the Jewish people. And that's how I acted. Begin moves from Brisk to Warsaw to study law. He dreams of using his legal training to help the needy. There, he is appointed Betal Commissioner in Poland, and later that year, meets the love of his life. Sitting at the table were two girls of 17, twins. Right then and there, I decided that one of them would be my wife. The next day, I sent her a note. I saw you, miss, for the very first time, but it seems that I've known you for my entire life. A year before the war broke out, Zev Jabotinsky said, I warn you, Jews of Poland, that the catastrophe is approaching. I remember his most dramatic speech in Warsaw, Poland, with words that I will never forget. Liquidate the exile before the exile liquidates you. As the Nazis invade Poland, the Begins escape to Vilna. Let's join them. We reached Vilna, the capital of Lithuania, which was a neutral country. About a year after we arrived, the Soviet Union extended its political and military control over Lithuania. And when the time came, when the NKVD agents came to take me on that long, unknown path, I was not at all afraid. I was charged with treason to communism and subversive behavior against the government. Shemchau Begin, Menachem ben Zev Begin. אם כן, אני החוקר השופט שלך. אגב, אני קראתי כל מה שכתבת פה, וזה כמו שאומרים, צ'יפוחה. חסר ערך, אפשר לזרוק לפארק זבל. תאמר לי, ממתי היית לציוני? מימי ילדותי. אני רואה שהתחלת בגיל מוקדם מאוד בפעולתך הנפשעת. למה נפשעת? אני חושב כי פעילותי הייתה נכונה וצודקת. זה מאוד חשוב מה אתה חושב. זה מאוד חשוב מה חושב מנחם וולפוביץ' בגין. ואני חושב שאתה פושע פוליטי גדול. ואתה יותר גרוע מרוצחם של עשרה אנשים. אבל למה? 
היא כל הפעולתך הייתה אנטי סובייטית ואנטי מהפכנית. במה הייתה אנטי סובייטית? לא לשאול שאלות בחדר הזה. Even when the facts were with me, under no circumstances could the NKVD officer accept that. It was not me standing opposite my interrogator. It was one world poised against another. Idea versus idea, with a gap between them that the truth could not bridge. מכר ותיק שלנו, הרי הוא מנהיג הפשיזם היהודי, לא? לא נכון. ז'בוטינסקי היה אנטי פשיסט. הוא היה ליברל בנשמתו. ליברל? איזו רטוריקה. אתה מעמיד פנים כאילו נעלבת בגלל שאני אמרתי אמת על המנהיג שלנו? אינני מעמיד פנים. ז'בוטינסקי היה מורי ורבי. האם אתה אזרח שופט? לא היית עושה אותו הדבר לו לא היו פוגעים בזכרו של לנין? No one gets out of here, said the sentry who led Begin to the prison camp on the banks of Lake Fechura in Siberia. After eight months in which his health suffered from hunger, the freezing cold and hard labor, the gates opened and he began his journey to the land of Israel. Since my earliest childhood, my father taught me that we must return to the land of Israel. Not to walk, not to ride, and not to come, but to return to the land of our forefathers. In Israel, the couple is reunited. Only after his official release from the Polish army does Begin join the Irgun. As World War II rages, the Irgun declares a revolt against the mandatory regime, and the Begin couple moves to this hideout apartment. <laughs> עוד קרוב לשנתיים לחכות עד שיושמט אחרון היהודים באירופה. רק אז אנחנו נתחיל לחשוב על מדינה יהודית. יצאנו למלחמה. So we already, we already learned a lot in that first clip. Um, and I want to start with a few questions for you. And I know we're getting questions from the audience that we'll try to get to as well. So as we see here in this first clip, the Haganah were cooperating with the British, while Begin's Etzel or Yergun um, army were not. Um, and many of us you know, have been told that the Etzel and Lehi were extremist or even terrorist organizations. So how do you respond to that sort of dichotomy? Um, well, I have no doubt that, the, that certainly the British saw them, uh, saw them as terrorists and, and referred to them as such. Um, but it's important to uh, state a few things. Um, firstly, that uh, Begin, I mean, as you saw from the clip, um, it's, you can't overstate the importance of uh, Zev Zabotinsky's um, inspiration and, and thinking on, on Menachem Begin. And um, one of the things that he took from, uh, from one of the many things he took from uh, Zabotinsky Uh, was the uh, was the belief that civilian casualties um, should be uh, avoided at all costs um, and the uh, and the targeting civilians was not was not was was not on the agenda was not part of the um, the the uh, the revolt against the British um, the most famous if you like uh, um, what the British referred to as a terrorist attack uh, was of course the the bombing of the King David hotel. Uh, in 1946 um, but uh, again that was not it was not operating as a hotel this was not a civilian target this was the the headquarters of the of the British military authorities um, and um, there were uh, two separate warnings given um, uh, ahead of the uh, explosion in an attempt to avoid uh, civilian casualties and we, we we know from a number of sources that Begin was was genuinely you Um, distraught that that um, that that many people had been that many people had been killed 
um, as a result of the as a result of them essentially not not um, not um, accepting the, the the warning as as sincere. Um, the, the other thing I'd just say about that is uh, another another point that Begin took from uh, from Jabotinsky was um, Be- Jabotinsky's famous thesis of the Iron Wall, uh, which came from an essay that he wrote uh, in in the early twenties. And many again, this is something which has been misrepresented. I think a lot of people see it as a as an as a, as proof, if you like, of the militarism or the extremism of um, of Jabotinsky and and then. Uh, by extension of Begin, uh, but actually the, the Iron War was um, what it what it essentially said was that uh, Jabotinsky realizing this way ahead of 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 anyone else really in the Zionist movement that the Arabs would not be placated um, that there w- there was no point in trying to seek a compromise with them because in his words um, there are there are living people that are not going to be just bought off with. Um, with uh, you know, with bread or money or other things, that they, they are going to fight. And if we want to secure our independence, we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to fight back. And so he um, he proposed uh, that the Zionist movement and then ultimately the Jewish state would have to um, uh, raise an, uh, an iron wall, not literally a wall, but a but essentially a, an impregnable uh, military might. Um, which which would persuade ultimately persuade the Arabs that when that we were not going anywhere, and that only then, when the Arabs accepted that, um, would we be able to reach uh, would we be able to make peace with them, and that has, that actually is is in fact what what transpired as we as we'll see with uh, with Israel's peace, first peace agreement with Egypt um, that the Arab they they had accepted um, that Israel was. Um, that there was no way that Israel could be removed, that it had established itself as a military power. And I think that relates also to the question of how Begin, of how Begin um, is maybe seen, and I think, and from my view, um, misunderstood in terms of the, uh, the military activity of, uh, of the Etzel, of the Ergun. Yeah, in, ter- in terms of how Begin was perceived, we, we, someone was asking, um, Milton in New York was asking, was he a socialist? Um, is that how he would have identified Begin, absolute no. The, the opposite, in fact, he was he was very much not a socialist, and, and he was he saw him as as Herzl Markov said in his introduction. Begin identified as a, as a liberal, as a, as a national liberal. Um, part of that liberalism was believing in individual freedom and individual rights, um, and therefore very much against uh, the socialist idea. Uh, and the, the socialism was the was the ideology of of Begin's opponents in the Zionist movement, Ben Gurion's. Uh, movement in uh, in the Zionist uh, camp, and also in the. I, I would like no, I would like just to add to Paul' uh, remark that Begin for sure wasn't a socialist, but he believed very much in social justice. He believes still that the state has responsibility to take care of those who are uh, weakened or fail, uh, uh, and the society and the state has responsibility, but. The economy should be a free market economy. That makes sense. And in the film, I believe he was sentenced to eight years in the Siberian prison camp, but he only served for less than one year. Is that correct? And how did he manage yeah. to do that? Yeah, what happened is, you know, uh, that's the, uh, sometimes the laugh of history. Uh, mm-hmm. Begging because he was a, a, a Polish uh, native, uh, you know that the Nazis were allies with the, the Russian in the beginning of the war. Uh, the agreement between uh, Molotov and uh, Ribbentrop, the two uh, um, foreign ministers of the two countries. Uh, but in the, uh, the Germans changed their orientation and decided to attack Russia or the Soviet Union. And then the, the Stalin changed his alignment and he joined try to join the allies and part of the agreement was to create a free polish army that was the demand of uh, the british government and to uh, uh, free all the uh, polish citizens that uh, were prison in uh, in russia and they joined the, that army that uh, known as general andres army uh, that was the commander of the polish army so because he was a Polish citizen, he was able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to spend only eight months and not eight years in, in the 
concentration camp in C Siberia. That's a good thing for him. Um, so let's go to the, the second clip, which is uh, a little bit shorter. It's about Fagan um, in his public life as a public figure. Um, Paul, do you want to introduce this video? Yeah, so this is, yeah, as you said, this is just a few minutes and, and we're going to begin with, uh, with the, the famous uh, Altalena controversy uh, and continuing into Begin's nearly 30 years as leader of the opposition in the Knesset. Finally, when the State of Israel was established, Begin came out of hiding, integrated the Irgun into the newly formed IDF, and transitioned into overt political activity. After the British left the country, about a month after we had founded the state, the boat Altalena arrived in the country carrying 940 immigrants, men and women, as well as large quantities of arms. Following negotiations with the government of Israel over the distribution of arms, an IDF mortar fired at the ship and it began to sink. 16 Etzel members were killed, among them survivors of the Holocaust. Many others were wounded. Begin gave the order to cease firing. It was obvious to me that I had to order the Etzel fighters to restrain themselves in order to prevent a civil war, Menachem Begin later explained. It was the most important decision of my life. This difficult event does not demoralize Begin. He runs in the Knesset election repeatedly as the head of the Herut party. Follow me to Begin's hideout apartment, where he continued to reside during all of his years in the opposition. Welcome to the Begin family apartment on Rosenbaum 1 Street in Tel Aviv. Well, technically, we're still at the Begin Center in Jerusalem, but we've created an exact reconstruction of the Begin's living room here. I'm currently sitting in the original armchair where Begin would relax when he lived in Tel Aviv. To be honest, this isn't only the family's living room. It's also the Begin couple's bedroom. That's what happened when you raise three children in a one and a half bedroom apartment. At night, the sofa unfolded into a bed. In those years, Begin led a series of social, political and ideological struggles. Let's look at one of many examples. In the counting of the votes for the fourth Knesset, which was completed last night, the Mapai party received 47 seats. The Herut party received 15. The Knesset is a parliament with 120 members. These representatives of the people sit in a semi-circle with the 14 members of the coalition government in its center. The debates are sometimes very stormy, but in the end order is restored after the voting takes place. Even after Herut's failure in the elections, Begin did not relent. He believed that the main role of Herut was to build an alternative to Mapai, and he defined the role of the opposition. An opposition is based on three principles, on giving voice to the differences, on proving the ultimate unity of the people, and on a constant struggle to replace the government. His major campaign is for the preservation of human rights and liberty. We believe that people have rights that precede that form of human existence that is called a state. Begin fought unceasingly for the principles of justice and liberty. He decried all forms of social injustice and defended every individual. <laughs> Begin 
ללא הבדל לאום או דת או מוצא. So um, some of the questions that, that come to mind are, you know, what is the significance of the Atalena affair? And we have some people in the audience asking as well about it. Um, well, there's a few things to say about it. I mean, firstly, I'd say, I, I think two main things that I, that I would say. One is, one is an example of the personal animosity that Ben-Gurion had for Begin, um, which continued throughout the um, Uh, Ben-Gurion's time in, 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 in parliamentary, uh, in, his, in his political life. Uh, for example, Begin, uh, Ben-Gurion refused to call Begin by name in the Knesset. He would, he would refer to him as, as the, the, the man sitting next to M.K. Bada, the, the, the uh, Yochanan Bada, who sat next to Begin in the Knesset. Um, and it's, what I think is impressive on Begin's part is that, that despite... Um, the way Ben Gurion behaved towards him, also demon, like real demonization of, of Begin and, and, uh, and his reputation. Um, Begin um, had remarkable um, uh, generosity of spirit. Uh, he, um, for example, um, when Begin joined the government for the, for the first time in a, in a, in a coalition, a, a unity government coalition in the build-up to the Six-Day War, um, Begin was one of those who, who called for uh, Ben Gurion's return Um, to the government um, because of a lack of confidence in, in Prime Minister Levi Ashkol. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, 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 I think, remarkable. But another thing to say about Adelena is that, um, and, and it was mentioned in the clip, um, that the most important thing for Begin, and Begin said this several times in his life, that, that, that it was the most important decision he ever made, um, was his decision not to fight back, not to fire back against Um, the the soldiers who were firing at the Elta Len. And this this idea that there, this this um, firm commitment on Begin's part that there must never be a civil war, um, that Jews must Jews must not fight Jews, um, was an absolute position, an absolutist position uh, for him. Mm -hmm. And there was a reference um, in the clip to Begin's commitment to human rights, and we heard Herzl talking about, you know, his belief in social justice, which hmm. seems to sort of, you know, differ from a lot of people's views of him as a war maker or a revolutionary. So how do you, how do you explain that dissonance in those two characteristics? Um, well, I think firstly, there's a, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of misrepresentation, I think, of Begin, and, and, and there's a few reasons. I, I'd, I'd suggest three, three, uh, three reasons. One is, which I mentioned just now, is that Ben-Gurion very deliberately set out to demonize Um, Begin and Ben Gurion was was essential was the victor of the of the early Zionist struggles. The labor movement of Ben Gurion was the largest movement, and the the victor writes writes the history books essentially. Um, and I think also outside Israel, uh, there was a generation of Jews who who grew up uh, inspired by the birth of Israel, and who and who also grew up with Ben Gurion as the father of the new Israel, and and very much a hero. Um, and so, if he was painting Begin as As the bad guy, then I think a lot of a lot of people outside Israel would um, weren't going to argue with him about that. So I think part of it is is the way that Begin was was depicted by his political rivals. Secondly, I think is that um, in in later years um, after the, this period that we've just seen, um, what became known as what the, the the right and left in Israel came to be defined very um, very specifically to do with. Um, uh, the settlement movement in, in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and, and opposition to a Palestinian state. And both of these positions, support for the settlements and opposition to a Palestinian state, were very firm positions of Begin's. So anyone that, that wants to look at sort of left and right and attach all kinds of other positions to the right also, I think, attach those to Begin. And, and I think we have this tendency to simplify things by using a broad brush. So we know that Labour was left-wing, it was socialist, Begin's Herut party in later Likud was the, was the opposition, so it's, it's right-wing, even though Begin himself actually didn't refer to himself usually as right-wing. He referred to himself as a, as a liberal, as a national liberal, liberal nationalist. Um, and he had all kinds of views which don't, really, which don't fit what at least some people think of as, as right-wing views today, rightly or wrongly. Um, uh, as op you might have, if you were reading the text that was scrolling the screen um, during um, the, the uh, presenter's 
um, taught there, uh, you might have noticed that, for example, um, he fought against the military administration of, Ar- of Israeli Arabs, which was it, which Ben Gurion instituted and which was in in force until 1966. And Begin was opposed to that on the grounds that these are citizens of Israel, and a democratic state does not, um, uh, you know, impose a military curfew on its own citizens. Um, based on their ethnicity or their, their national their national origin. He was a firm uh, free speech advocate. Um, there was a famous case of him um, speaking out against um, a decision by a decision by Ben Gurion to uh, detain a far left wing journalist who wrote a lot of um, uh, incendiary articles against the government. And even though this journalist was also very much against Begin, um, Begin um, uh, threatened Ben Gurion that he would. Uh, you know, uh, it, um, call for protest across the country if, if this was if this was done, and Ben Gurion actually backed down. So Begin was Begin was a, was a classical liberal, um, like Jabotinsky before him, and he very much believed in, um, as was said, in, in human rights and civil rights and individual rights. Um, and and this became also clear when he became prime minister, as we'll, as we'll see. Mm-hmm. I have many more questions, as does the audience, but I want to get to the third clip, and then we'll. Go back to some more questions after that. So keep them coming. Okay, so so we're gonna. This is a this is a, a longer clip now, looking at uh, Begin's uh, after he becomes prime minister in 1977. Uh, the big um, what was called in Hebrew the Mahapach, uh, the upheaval or turnabout, where um, uh, nearly 30 years of, of rule by the by the labor movement um, were uh, was undone by the election of uh, of Begin's Likud party. Um, and we'll see his time in office and his his many um, uh, achievements and the many significant events that took place uh, during his tenure. Great. And finally, the big day has arrived. I was the leader of the National Council of the Israeli Union, who fought for the liberation of the United States. His Excellency President Ephraim Katsir, I hereby impose the task of forming a government on member of Knesset, Menachem Begin. In response to an interviewer's question, at this time, can you tell us what style you plan to adopt as Prime Minister of Israel? Menachem Begin answered, And what is a more Jewish action than to extend one's hand in peace. My personal and written invitation to President Sadat to come to Jerusalem to visit our big Jewish. I'm looking forward uh, uh, to fulfill this visit uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the earliest time possible. Only half a year has passed since Begin became Prime Minister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inna l'insihab al-kamil. من الأرض العربية المحتلة بعد 67 أمر بديهي لا نقبل فيه الجد لمدن من الهستوريا دنيا نسي كي الملخماء نمنات الشلوم وبلت نمنات As they parted from each other on the ramp leading to the plane, Begin shook his guest's hand and said to him, Mr. President, we will make peace. I am sure of that, Sadat answered. And the dream of peace was transformed from a vision into negotiations. March 1979, the first peace agreement between Israel and an Arab state was signed on the White House lawn. The triple handshake between Begin, Sadat and Carter has become an icon in the history of international relations. No more bereavement, peace unto you, shalom, salam, forever. Begin and Sadat were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of the Israel-Egypt Peace Agreement. However, 
peace is only one milestone in a series of steps Begin took to implement his values. Begin was raised on the teaching of Jabotinsky, who believed that every individual is king and that the role of society is to serve the individual. It is on this basis that Begin acts to ensure human freedom. Begin never forgot the months he spent in prison when his freedom was denied him. When it came to personal liberty, his directives were unequivocal. Even when fighting terror, there will be no use of torture, only the cleverness of the interrogator. And from the individual to the society. Here too, Menachem Begin follows in the footsteps of his teacher Jabotinsky. He works to ensure five basic fundamentals for each individual. Benefit the people wasn't just a campaign slogan to Begin. He may not have known the price of a car, but he always knew the cost of a loaf of bread. Begin initiated the free high school law and announced a program to renovate the impoverished neighborhoods. The project, based on increasing the local population's responsibility for their surroundings, was launched in 127 neighborhoods. While renovating the poor neighborhoods, Begin also promoted liberal economic policies. The justice in which Begin believes is not only social justice. After coming out of hiding, Begin announces, and in our country, justice will be the supreme ruler, the ruler of all rulers. Let there be no tyranny. Let those who hold office serve society and not dominate it. The new settlement named Elon Moret was established on the peak of a mountain 600 meters above sea level. There are judges in Jerusalem, said Begin, when a court ruling forced him to rescind the government's decision regarding the settlement of Elon Moret. Respect for the law and the supremacy of the judicial system were deeply ingrained in Begin's worldview. Democracy is not possible without the supervision of the Supreme Court over the Knesset and the government. But make no mistake, the integrity of the homeland was a key component in Begin's worldview. Begin's commitment to the integrity of the land of Israel was not based solely on security. Would he abandon one of the key principles of his philosophy in order to achieve peace? But the mutual respect they had for each other's principles was not enough. Begin searched for a solution that would not force him to abandon his worldview. That is how the autonomy plan was born. Autonomy for the inhabitants and not for the land. They will enjoy self-rule, autonomy. They will elect in Judea, Samaria, in the Gaza Strip, their own uh, administrative council. Begin's concern for the integrity of the land of Israel always went hand in hand with his concern for the people of Israel and their return to the homeland, to Zion. As Prime Minister, Begin met with many significant diaspora Jewish leaders.
Prior to his first meeting with Begin, Rabbi Schindler was expecting to disapprove of the man labeled as extremist by the Israeli left. Instead, in his words, he was the first Israeli leader I'd met for whom it was more important to be a Jew than an Israeli. He really cared about us. During all his years in the Knesset, Begin had raised the banner of free immigration to Israel. Now that he was Prime Minister, this became one of his top priorities. In could not go into details, but I will tell you what he meant. In 1977, the government of Israel made a secret decision to bring the Jews of Ethiopia to the country. But of course, it is not enough to gather the exiles to Israel. Israel's safety and security as a state must be ensured. An enormous clock towers above us and is ticking, said Prime Minister Menachem Begin in a cabinet meeting in which the destruction of the Osirak nuclear reactor in Iraq was approved. <laughs> But the military success was accompanied by internal and international condemnation. Only 10 years after the strike did Begin receive a letter signed by 100 members of Knesset, thanking him for attacking the reactor. Can you believe it? All of those accomplishments in just four years. But Begin doesn't slow down. He runs for a second term as prime minister. The 1981 elections were the most heated in the history of the state of Israel. Menachem Begin is the motivating force that stirs up the masses and turns the surveys upside down. At an election rally, more than 10,000 people came to hear the prime minister and minister of defense Menachem Begin. In his speech, Mr. Begin referred to the bombing of the Iraqi nuclear reactor, which took place a week ago. At a Labour Party election rally held in Kings of Israel Square in Tel Aviv, comedian Duda Topaz attempted to translate the people's love for the IDF into support for the Labour Party. The Likud's tough guys do guard duty in army bases if they even serve in the army at all, he said. At a Likud rally held at the same spot the next day, Menachem Begin referred back to the fuse that had been ignited on the ethnic time bomb and took bitter account of the rival party. <laughs> Let me 
בני עדות המזרח שלנו היו לוחמים גיבורים גם במחתרת. פיינשטיין היה ממוצא אירופאי, איך קוראים לו אשכנזי? משה ברזני היה ספרדי מעיראק. אשכנזי, עיראקי, יהודי, אחי, לוחמי! Some think that this speech changed the balance of power and brought about the election of the Likud in 1981. By the smallest margin of only one parliamentary seat, Begin and the Likud win the election and go on to form the government. Armed with the renewed confidence of the electorate, Begin continued on his path convinced that he could navigate through all the latest developments. Begin decided to annex the Golan Heights at the very first opportunity. He arrived at the Knesset debate in a wheelchair after slipping in the bath and breaking his thigh. That same day, the law passed three readings in the Knesset. A short time later, he found himself navigating his way through a tense situation building up on the country's northern frontier. An American government that disagrees with some of his positions, a new Egyptian president, and opposition at home, demanding that he abandon his agreement to evacuate the settlements in the Amid region. Believe me, that question of the settlements in Northern Sinai, to decide to remove them, is perhaps the deepest pain in my heart. I, I will carry it with me to the last day of my life. The government of Israel has decided to charge the IDF with the responsibility of removing the settlements of the Galilee from the firing range of terrorists. concentrated in their command posts and bases in Lebanon. The name of the operation is Peace for the Galilee. Operation Peace for the Galilee was launched with widespread public approval. First, even when the military operation exceeded its objectives, there was wide consensus over its goals. Begin was convinced that Operation Peace for the Galilee, a war launched by choice, would bring peace to the Galilee. Shalom la Galil uva Galil lechol yishuva u lechol toshava. Hayiti ben Ariya lefnei shavu yamin. Hayiti et toshavim ve tayladim. Schok beinayim. Osher belibam. חיים חדשים נתנו להם! But reality struck him in the face. The limited military operation became something very different from what he had intended, planned, and announced, and turned into a long and difficult war. שמי בגין מנחם, תפקידי ראש הממשלה. Commission of Inquiry, Session 21, Witness 21. The second Prime Minister has now appeared before a Commission of Inquiry, He was the first to testify before an open court. Dozens of young people stood opposite the Prime Minister's residence in Jerusalem carrying a sign that was updated each day with the number of soldiers killed in the war. That number grew consistently, but Begin rejected the Secret Service's proposals that the demonstrators be moved away from the door of his house. 
His sorrow over the losses was augmented by personal tragedy. He received news that his beloved wife, Eliza, had died while he was in the United States. At today's cabinet meeting, various topics were discussed, and the Prime Minister announced that he intends to resign from the position of Prime Minister. Begin shut himself up in his apartment in Jerusalem. He refused to be interviewed about current events or even explain his silence. Only family members and a few close friends were allowed to meet with him. Some think that once again, Begin assumed full responsibility for everything that happened under his leadership. The man whose words echoed through the public squares and whose speeches energized the masses came to the end of his way in silence. This is the Voice of Israel from Jerusalem. It is 9 o'clock and here is the news. Menachem Begin, the sixth Prime Minister of the State of Israel, died this morning at the age of 79. Begin resigned as Prime Minister in 1983. Over the past few years, he has shut himself up in his home and vanished from the public eye. Menachem Begin passed away surrounded by the love of people everywhere. An entire nation took its leave of a brave and beloved leader. ברחבה זו אמורים היו להיערך טקסים לזכרו, אבל בגין ביקש כידוע להיקבר כאחד האדם והעם. His son will say the Kaddish. Menachem Begin, commander of the Irgun Tzvai Leumi, prime minister of Israel, who was laid to rest in the soil of Jerusalem. So many questions. I will try to combine as many of them as I can into one question for now. Um, so firstly, you know, Begin was in opposition for about 29 years, which I guess is more than a third of his life when he was not in power, not calling the shots. Why was that period so significant for the state of Israel? And then moreover, perhaps, you know, what do you and others who remember Begin think of as sort of his most, um, you know, standout moments in his life, whether positive or negative? Was it peace with Egypt? Was it the Lebanon War? Was it um, his opposition to settlements, which, uh, you know, or to um, a Palestinian state, of, excuse me, you know, what, what was sort of the most significant thing that people remember about, um, about him today? On, on that first point um, about his time in opposition, um, it's really important that he, for him, it was, a, it was a really important role that he played. He didn't see it as, um, as being, he didn't see being leader of the opposition as, a, as an irrelevant uh, position at all. He, he once said that um, a, a free nation needs both a government and an opposition. Um, and he, his, his, part of his liberalism uh, was believing that in a, in a democracy, the majority have the right to, to rule, um, but uh, the minority voice must be heard. There, always, there has to be room for, for the minority to have its voice heard, for the minority to be able to critique the majority, to criticize, rebuke the majority, uh, and to present itself as an alternative. And he, and that was that was very important to him. And I think, and, and in terms of the contribution of that period of his life um, to, to the state of Israel, I would say that I, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that Begin um, define, he set a precedent for the role of um, opposition and parliamentary debate in Israeli democracy. Um, so that, that's the, the first question. Um, and I mean, the mo I mean, look, in terms of his achievements, uh, I'm sure uh, Herzl Makov will have much more to say on this. But um, I, from my perspective, I think, you know, you can point to the peace agreement with Egypt uh, which was the first agreement, first peace deal with an Arab uh, country, not just any Arab country, but the most important Arab country, um, uh, a peace deal which has stood the test of time, uh, which removed 
the security threat from Israel's um, uh, also the major security threat from Israel's southern border um, and has been has proven to be a very important rela- security relationship, including in recent years with uh, cooperation over attacking Hamas in Gaza. Um, the uh, bombing of the uh, Osirak reactor in, in Iraq, um, which was the establishment of what became known as the Begin Doctrine, the, the idea that no, no, no declared enemy of Israel should be able to, to obtain the means uh, to destroy Israel, which is really, which is really Begin's um, response to the Holocaust. Uh, Begin saying never again. And I think that's, uh, th- those are two that I would, I would offer. But I mean, there are so many things. His, his, as, as, as Herzl said at the beginning, he changed Israel. He changed Israeli society. He created the, a, a free market, free enterprise in Israel, leaving socialism behind. Um, this was this made possible the Israel that we have today, the Israel, the startup nation that everyone talks about and writes about w- would, would have been impossible without those, without those reforms of, of 40 years ago. Um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and maybe, maybe Herzl uh, will want to add to what I've said. Well, I agree uh, with Paul about all the, points that he uh, mentioned as Begin achievement. But if we are going back to what Begin said, so he said after he was a prime minister, and it's a quote, after uh, uh, signing the peace treaty, after uh, ordering, uh, bombing the uh, nuclear reactor in Iraq, and then initiating uh, project renewal, still the most important decision of my life was to prevent a civil war in 48. Um, and uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, in 48, we were uh, in, on the edge. Uh, it wasn't certain. Uh, you know, uh, the United States uh, administration were sure that we are going to lose the war. And so uh, many other around the world. And, and, it's, uh, and it was realistic. So if in that case, even a very small uh, scale uh, civil war would occur, um, who knows where we uh, have been. So for him, that decision uh, to prevent civil war uh, was the most important decision of his life. Yeah, so I think I think you both just sort of answered my, what was going to be my final question, which was how do you see his legacy today, you know, decades after his, his passing? Can I just? Sure. Can I add one thing? I, I, the, you, the, there was the, the bit of the, the very first clip talked about his him being buried um, next to uh, um, Mayor Feinstein and Moshe Barzani, the two uh, Lehi and Irgun er- er- fighters, and he mentions it. Begin mentions it in the, in that speech that you saw. His response to the to the to the um, uh, basically anti Sephardi joke made at a Labour Party rally, right? This reference to the Chachachim, which was a derogatory term for Sephardi Jews. And Begin, who was, you know, this quintessential Ashkenazi Jew, you know, from, from Poland, um, nevertheless, um, part of his appeal was that he saw the unity of the Jewish people, um, regardless of their background and where they were from. And even, and, and, in, and in fact, whether they were diaspora or Israel, that was also important, his, commi- his connection to diaspora Jews. Um, that was that was, I think, absolute of absolute importance to him, and his decision to be buried in between those two, one Ashkenazi, one Sephardi, I think, also spoke to that. Um, and so, for me, um, perhaps also coming as an Ole, uh, as, a, as someone that made Aliyah from uh, to, to, to Israel, um, that he's someone who um, speaks to uh, this this concept of Jewish peoplehood, which was not a term that was in operation when Begin was was prime minister, but, but I think he, he almost sort of foresaw it as, as a, as a, as an idea that, that transcended the divides between Israel and diaspora, between Sephardi and Ashkenazi, and also between left and right, because although he was obviously very firm in his own convictions, um, he, he, his, you saw when he died, the masses came to his funeral, a regard people that didn't never voted for him. Um, and I think that's also very, uh, very telling. Yeah. I th- um, 
you know, there are many things that we can learn from uh, the legacy, from the uh, philosophy, and from uh, uh, the time he was in power and what he did um, in order to take uh, inspiration. But I would like very much that every one of us, young generation, young leaders, leaders in every walks of life, and I'm not talking only about prime ministers, will take uh, his uh, model of leadership, which uh, in one hand, I would call it value-driven leadership. You don't uh, make a decision because of the uh, survey of uh, last night or because of the headline of tomorrow uh, papers, but you have a set of values and see how you integrate those values to your decisions. Uh, and the other thing is putting the, the person, the human being, in the, the focus of your decision making and begging love people. He, he used actually to embrace and kiss, you know, maybe today with all the, the uh, new Excellent. values. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to use this term because he wouldn't, he wouldn't go that far. But uh, he embraced people. He kissed children on their forehead. Uh, he, he really, uh, and he was interested in the story of every uh, clean lady in the prime minister, what's going on with her grandchildren. Uh, so putting the, the, the ordinary citizens, the ordinary Jew, in the focus of your world and to be a proud Jew.